Hello everybody, it's nice to see you for our last session of the first day of the uh, Common Goods Summit on this session on inequality before and after coronavirus. Uh, we will have, uh, that for a very passionate conversation between uh, two uh, Nobel laureates uh, and um, in order to introduce them and uh, to moderate the debate, I have the pleasure to uh, uh, introduce Nicolas Verquin, which is in Chicago. Hello, Nicolas. You are prof, uh, professor associate in uh, Toulouse School of Economics for about five years in the fields of uh, um, fiscal policy, redistribution, welfare, all these tools in order to fight inequality. And uh, a month ago, you had a new step in your professional life since you have taken a job in Chicago and a job of economist of the uh, uh, Federal Reserve. So, Nicolas, I will uh, give you the floor from Paris to Chicago and thank you very much for uh, moderating this debate with us. Thank you very much, uh, Vincent, for this kind introduction. Uh, and before I start, let me mention that everything I will say today uh, reflects my own views and not those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago or of the Federal Reserve System. Um, so we are incredibly honored to receive today to welcome uh, Professor Angus Deaton and Professor Amartya Sen. Um, Professor Angus Deaton will start with a keynote. Um, he received the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2015 for his work on consumption, poverty, and development economics. Understanding and measuring people's consumption choices is crucial to be able to design policies aimed at reducing poverty. How does consumption depend on income and the prices of all the goods in the economy? How would the demand for cars, for instance, react if the government were to raise the tax rate on consumption goods? And how would social welfare change? To answer these questions, Deaton builds abstract theoretical models of individual behavior that naturally deliver aggregate statistical relationships between prices and demand, which he can then easily estimate in the data. One of Deaton's guiding principles, which we consider to be extremely important at the Toulouse School of Economics, is that the measurement of economic relationships in the data has to be consistent with a theoretical economic model. We cannot just let the data speak and be agnostic about the underlying theoretical mechanisms. Only once a theoretical framework is specified will, be, will we be able to extrapolate the empirical evidence and design a novel set of policy interventions that will foster the common good. So this is an insight that I think we should be very careful to keep in mind in the age of big data. In the later part of his career, Deaton shifted his focus to the question of how and why some places in the world started growing 300, 300 years ago, accumulating unprecedented amount of wealth and dramatically improving health, but also generating unbearable inequalities between countries. Along with his wife and fellow economist Anne Case, he also focused on rising income and health inequalities within the US, where the recent increase in mortality from suicide, drug, or alcohol abuse is unique among developed nations. I highly encourage you to read his two latest books, The Great Escape and Deaths of Despair. They are packed with thought-provoking insights about the economics of development and inequality. Um, now, without further ado, Professor Deaton, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Nicola, for that very generous introduction. Let me just plunge right in. When people talk about inequality, they are often thinking about inequality in income or inequality in wealth. Both are important, and I shall talk about them, especially wealth inequality. But I want to start with a different kind of inequality, not distributional inequality, which is by who gets what, but relational inequality, which is the inequality when not everyone in society is treated as deserving equal consideration and respect when some groups are assigned greater worth than others, or when some groups are not given full rights as participants in a democratic society. There are first-class citizens and second-class citizens. We're all too familiar with racial and ethnic inequalities, as well as gender inequalities. 
My main concern here is with educational inequalities in the United States today, with the increasingly different lives led by those who do or do not have a college degree. Bear in mind that only a third of American adults have a four-year college degree. The bachelor's degree has increasingly become a passport not only to a good job, the kind of job that is worth doing and whose rewards have steadily increased over the last half century, but also to good health, a long life, and a flourishing social life. Without it, you risk being a second-class citizen with implications for life at home, at work, and in society. Michael Sandel notes that the idea that a college degree is a condition of dignified work and social esteem has a corrosive effect on democratic life. It devalues the contributions of those without the diploma, fuels prejudice against less educated members of society, effectively excludes most working people from representative government, and provokes political backlash. In our book, Deaths of Despair in the Future of Capitalism, and Case and I have told the story of how the lives of less educated Americans have, on average, deteriorated relative to the lives of those with a college degree. This began 50 years ago, around 1970, and continued up to the pandemic. Perhaps the most prominent differences are seen in mortality and in life expectancy. After a century of increasing life in expectancy, not only an indicator of health, but as many would argue, a sensitive indicator of the state of society, life expectancy in the U.S. fell for three years in a row, from 2014 through 2017, something that had not happened in this century since the last pandemic in 1918. The rising mortality came from a slowdown and cessation of the decline in deaths from cardiovascular disease that has been the main engine of mortality improvement for the last quarter century, as well as from increases in accidental drug overdose, the opioid epidemic, suicides, and alcoholic liver disease. We refer to these three kinds of deaths as deaths of despair. Remarkably, this rising epidemic of deaths of despair has almost entirely spared those with a college degree. For those without, we drew a parallel to Durkheim's analysis of suicide, where people find themselves in an economy and a society that no longer worked for them, that no longer provided the support that they needed to make their lives worth living. Even in normal times, there are suicides, drug overdoses, and deaths from alcoholism among both the more and the less educated. But the increase in deaths of despair, now running 100,000 people a year above the rate in the mid-90s, is confined to those without a college degree. It is as if those without the degree must wear a scarlet badge, badge with the letters N-O-B-A, no B-A. In contrast to what Durkheim believed, suicide itself is now more common among those without a college degree, those marked by the badge. Death is the last stop on the long road of despair. The starting point is a labor market that is increasingly failing those without a BA. The fraction of non-elderly adults who are employed has been declining for less educated men for half a century and for less educated women since 2000. In boom times, participation in work increases and it falls back in recessions, but the rise in each boom never attains the previous peak. The same is true for wages, falling and rising around a falling trend. For men, even in the boom leading to the pandemic, when the rise in wages for less educated men was being loudly celebrated, wages for men without a BA were lower than at any date in the 1980s. The failing labor market spills over into the rest of life. Unions are now almost non-existent in the private sector. Unions not only raised wages for their members as well as for many non-members, but also they monitored working conditions. Federal authorities are not always effective in preventing even the illegal practices, and we're often a center for social life. Bob Putnam's famous solitary bowler was bowling in a union hall. Unions provided countervailing power for working people, not only on the job, but in local and national politics. Unions have little power in Washington today, 
and even the most powerful union lobbyists are outspent by several individual corporations, such as Google. Marriage has declined among the less educated, but not among those with college degrees. Instead of marrying, many Americans participate in serial cohabitations, often having children, so that men in middle age, although often father to several children, do not know their kids who are living with their mothers or with other men. These fragile families are scarcely able to bring the support and contentment in middle age and beyond that can come from lifelong family commitments. Morbidity has risen alongside mortality. In an extraordinary reversal of the law of nature, middle-aged Americans now report more pain than do elderly Americans. Once again, this is true only for those without a BA, and it's not truly a reversal of the process of aging, but happens because those in midlife today have experienced more pain throughout their lives than have today's elderly. Half of the increase in deaths of despair comes from opioid overdoses. For this, pharmaceutical companies bear huge blame for addicting the population in search of enormous profits. Pharma knew to target the less educated because it was they whose lives were in disorder. And pharma and their distributed were supported and defended by politicians, some representing the districts most deeply affected. Money speaks very loudly in American politics. Meanwhile, suicide rates rose to the levels that used to characterize the most dreadful societies on earth, the former Soviet Union and its satellites, as well as women in China. Even those countries, as throughout the world, suicide rates have been falling. The US, especially the less educated US, is a notable and disgraceful exception. Despair is made worse by upward redistribution from poor to rich, the veritable opposite of Robin Hood, what in our book we call Sheriff of Nottingham redistribution. Opioids and the obscene profits of producers are only one example. Another is the healthcare system, which delivers the lowest life expectancy of any rich country, but which costs twice as much as it should. Hospital executives, device manufacturers, and pharma executives or pay huge salaries as they destroy low education labor markets through the cost of health insurance. The excess costs of the American system over the next most expensive system in terms of the share of national income, Switzerland, and not the total, just the excess, are enough to finance America's military with money to spare. As unions have faded, firms have consolidated with more monopoly and monopsony. Power has moved from labor to capital, supported by a steady drift of the legal system to pro-capital, as well as anti-union laws and rhetoric from the right. The wage share in national income has drifted down since 1970, and the profit share has drifted up. Productivity gains that used to show up in wage growth no longer do so. Corporate lobbying, rare in Washington before 1970, not only influences lawmakers, not least through providing useful but not exactly unbiased information, but by helping set the legislative agenda. The resulting laws are what Adam Smith described as those that, quotes, the glamour of our merchants and manufacturers has extorted from the legislature for the support of their own absurd and oppressive monopolies. Like the laws of Dracov, these laws may be said to be all written in blood or in deaths of despair. This is not a capitalism in which competitive markets yield benefit for all, more, quotes, a racket for redistributing upward than an engine of general prosperity. Politics has moved against the white working class over the last half century. The Democratic Party was once the home of working class Americans and of unions, but after 1970, it gradually transformed itself into an alliance of minorities and the well-educated, leaving less educated whites to drift to the Republicans. In the 1970s, states with longer life expectancy voted Republican, but by the presidential elections of 2016 and 2020, the correlation across states between the Republican share of the vote and life expectancy was minus 0.7. 
But Republican policies followed the interests of capital, not of labor, unless educated whites were left without effective political voice. They're 20 percentage points less likely to turn out in a presidential election than our more educated Americans. America's all-volunteer military, whose adoption owes much to Milton Friedman's advocacy, has brought us another two-class system in which the enlisted men and women, although not their officers, are drawn from those without a college degree, and it is they who have borne the unshared burden of America's frequent wars. Conscription does not share perfectly, but it can do so much more equitably than a volunteer army where volunteering is conditioned by education and income. <coughs> the economist Robert Solow served as a sergeant in World War II and has frequently and eloquently described what his service taught him about Americans who were different from him, people that he remained friends with all their lives. That shared experience, that understanding of people who are different from us, which need not necessarily be in the military, is something we have lost much to our cost. Income inequality rose inexorably after 1970, though with something of a pause after the financial crisis, at least up to the pandemic. The growth in wealth inequality also halted after the financial crisis. The very richest people in America, Bezos, Gates, Musk, Buffett, Ellison, Zuckerberg, the Waltons, Ballmer, Page, Brin, and Bloomberg are all men, no women. They're all men who started or developed companies that made new and useful things. Indeed, if growth is driven by innovation in a Schumpeterian process of creative destruction, a case can be made that those fortunes were earned in the public interest and contributed to the common good. These billionaires are, or once were, makers, not the takers who in much of the world became rich through inheritance, political favors, arms stealing, or corruption. That said, there is an increasing skepticism about the makers and whether the fortunes might not owe much to the exercise of destructive market power. Some argue that they like Amazon so much they would be happier still if there were two of them. Others have little difficulty in imagining a world without Facebook or Twitter. And nothing in Schumpeter tells us how large the rewards ought to be. Wealth is not only owned by the tech barons. A majority of Americans own stock market wealth, either directly or through divine contribution pension funds. But three quarters of all American wealth in 2016 was held by the one third of Americans with a four year college degree. As late as 1990, total wealth had been equally divided among those with and without the diploma. In 2016, among those with the BA, a third have postgraduate degrees and have a median net worth of more than $400,000, while those with only a BA had a median wealth of a little less than a quarter of a million. Within the two thirds without a BA, the median wealth was around $60,000. Then came COVID. Inequality showed up first in the labor market. Many highly educated people could continue to work online and continue to draw their salaries. Those with spacious housing could do so in com comfort with little or no inconvenience. Some of the less educated still had work but risked contracting the virus, while others in transportation, retail, entertainment, and a host of personal services had no work to go to. Unlike most contractions, unemployment fell most rapidly. Unemployment rose most rapidly for women, many of whom had childcare responsibilities that made it impossible to go to work. The CARES Act and later federal expending appears to have done a remarkably effective job of offsetting the financial effects of unemployment and of keeping up the demand for essentially, for certainly, for essential production such as food. At some dates during the pandemic, poverty was almost certainly lower than it had been at its start. And because so much of the spending was conditioned on income, it is likely that income inequality has increased, has decreased. There is a well-justified concern about children's education, especially for those without adequate internet access or those with low levels of parental support and supervision. 
children in private schools thrived while many in public schools did not. These inequalities are particularly distressing given the evidence on the long-term effects of interruptions in schooling. Inequalities in mortality followed familiar lives, though with some exceptions. Black non-Hispanics and Hispanics died at higher rates than did white non-Hispanics, and there were extraordinarily high mortality levels among American Indian and Alaskan Native communities. This was true for mortality from COVID itself, as well as for estimates of excess mortality, a larger number that includes COVID deaths that were not diagnosed as such. Hispanics are the exceptions to pre-existing patterns. Prior to the pandemic, Hispanic mortality rates were lower and life expectancy higher than among non-Hispanic whites. Native Americans have always had a relatively high mortality rate, but the increase during the pandemic was greatly in excess of the pre-existing difference. During 2020, COVID deaths among those with a VA were around half the number expected if deaths had been blown to education. This is surprising. Jobs in retail and hospitals, or even in meat packing plants or Amazon warehouses, were not particularly dangerous prior to the pandemic, and certainly not as dangerous as it became with an airborne virus. Yet the pre-existing educational differences in mortality were essentially preserved in the pandemic, not exaggerated. It is as if the educational advantages in mortality are almost invariant to the epidemiological environment in a way that is not true for racial and ethnic differences. The life-preserving skills of education appear to operate in a wide range of circumstances. Wealth inequalities have exploded during and indeed because of the pandemic. One estimate is that American billionaires have added a trillion dollars to their net worth, with Bezos the only centi-billionaire doubling his wealth. It is obvious that the pandemic would have been worse without Amazon, so it is not as if Bezos did nothing to earn his extra hundred billion. All of the tech titans have served as well during the pandemic, and all have been mightily rewarded for doing so. Whether those amounts are just or even necessary is a different question. But that is only one part of the story. The low interest rate policies that monetary authorities have pursued have tended to inflate the value of assets. Given that wealth is so unequally distributed, low interest rates exacerbate wealth inequality, arguably price that is worth paying to allow economies to recover from the pandemic. But this cannot be all because the effects have been different in different countries. For example, they've been much larger in the US than in Britain. The S&P 500 is 25% higher today than at the beginning of the pandemic. This is on top of a 400% increase from 2011 to the eve of the pandemic. And while the British FTSE has risen by 20% during the pandemic, it is currently 6% lower than at the end of 2020, at which time it had only gained 25% since 2011. Low interest rates are widespread, but it is the US that has the big tech companies that have become so valuable and which are expected to do even better in the future. Amazon, Alphabet, Microsoft, Apple, and Facebook well, account for almost a fifth of the S&P 500. The pandemic drove many of their big brick and mortar competitors out of business while government transfers to households propped up their spending. Remember too that the stock market values profits and conditional and national income responds negatively to higher wages. It has therefore been boosted by the declining share of labor, which can reasonably be expected to continue. Easy money and the rising fortunes of capital, particularly big tech, have put the American stock market on steroids, enriching not only the tech barons, but also the educated elite. The Democratic Party may not be the party of business, but it's well-educated cosmopolitan elites who, unlike the working class, have benefited from globalization and automation, have seen their portfolios shoot up over the last decade, rocketing further over the last year while they work safely at home on Zoom and WebEx. Meanwhile, 587,000 Americans have died of COVID. 
and likely many more. In major wars, the producers of arms and war material became rich, and that is now their prediction, their production, and even their profits were in the common good. Even universal conscription could not ensure that all citizens shared the burden equally. In the Second World War, the British Labour Party demanded a, quotes, conscription of wealth to match the conscription of labour. According to the political scientist Kenneth Skeeve and David Stasevaj, similar compensatory agreements, arguments were widespread to justify temporary high taxes in ex-belligerent countries after World War II. What ordinary people paid in blood, the producers paid in treasure. There is a good case for thinking along these lines to finance the costs of the pandemic. There is certainly little sign that business executives will restrain themselves. We know that executives award themselves bonuses when their firms are doing well, so whether or not the circumstances of their success have anything to do with their own behavior. Apparently the same is not true in bad times, and there are press accounts of CEOs changing the compensation rules to ensure that the pandemic could not negatively impact their compensation. Never mind that hundreds of thousands are dying. The pharma companies, the pharma companies that were the scourges before the pandemic, have now become our saviors. Johnson and Johnson, long one of America's most admired companies, the producer of band-aids and baby powder, turned to opium farming in Tasmania to feed the opioid epidemic. I like the analogy of a small island plagued by powerful pirates that regularly rape and pillage its shores. When a neighboring country threatens war, it is tempting to enlist the pirates to help and to be grateful when they do. But pirates are pirates, and even if they save us today, they will return to rape and pillage tomorrow, likely with even less restraint than before. Hospitals are the greatest contributor to health care costs, and they received large sums from the federal government during the pandemic a wise policy in the circumstances. Again, there are widespread press reports that some hospital systems use the grants to give bonuses to their executives while continuing to sue their patients for unpaid debts. <clears throat> there was hope at the beginning that the pandemic would expose more clearly the flaws in the American healthcare system, as well as the folly of providing health insurance to employers and of leaving more than 25 million uninsured. Fifteen months later, that hope seems forlorn, and it seems more likely that the pillaging will continue to apace. Surprisingly, given the dire straits of public health and of health systems in many poor countries, death tolls as a share of population have been higher in richer countries, even given the unfolding disaster in India. Even if deaths in India are understated by a factor of five or six, its per capita cumulative death toll would still be less than France, Spain, the US, the UK, or Italy. A result of the pattern of deaths, richer economies shrank by more during the pandemic. Even so, it is almost certainly the case that hardship and suffering have been worse in poorer countries. Similar percentage declines in national income will lead to larger increases in poverty in poorer countries. And the pandemic is not done yet. We do not know the final toll in India, and we do not know why African countries have seen so few deaths, let alone whether they will be permanently spared. Many thought that India had come through the worst. And the global distribution of vaccines is so far greatly in favor of rich countries, perhaps inevitably so. It will not be easy to vaccinate the world, though it is a crucial task that the rich countries must now undertake. What to do now? The deficits that were necessarily incurred during the pandemic are already leading to debates about whether and how they ought to be addressed. There are always hawks who push for austerity as they successfully did in many countries after the financial crisis. If that happens, the cost of the pandemic will be borne by those who've already suffered the most during it. There is a British proposal for a one-time temporary wealth tax, which could be mostly borne by housing and pensions. The IMF has suggested temporary taxes, what they call COVID-19 recovery contributions, 
on high incomes, profits, or wealth. All such proposals face political resistance, as well as many practical difficulties of evaluation and avoidance. But given the fortunes that have been made during the pandemic and the many deaths disproportionately borne by those who did not benefit financially, failure to do so would be a definitive sign that indeed we are not all in this together. Over the longer term, the burden of taxation must be adjusted to be fairer and to be seen to be fairer. Corporations need to be made to, tax, made to pay the taxes that they owe and international treaties need to be forged that will eliminate the widespread shifting of assets to avoid taxes. In the US, it has become too easy to avoid taxes on transactions that are not reported to the IRS, common among mid-sized businesses whose owners are heavily represented in the top tiers of the income distribution. The Biden administration is working on both of these issues. Power needs to be distributed back to labor and away from firms. The long-term harassment of unions need to stop and antitrust should be reinvigorated. We need fewer ex-corporate lawyers as judges. Again, the Biden administration is dedicated to these aims. A single-payer health healthcare system that covers everyone from birth and then enforces price controls would remove a metastasized cancer on the American economy that is not only reducing American health and wealth, but is redistributing from poor to rich. There is also much to be said for seizing the current opportunity to remake the American safety net into something more like a European welfare state. The Biden administration is clearly moving in this direction too, although it does not grasp the nettle that would be required to finance it, a value-added tax that is the embodiment of widely shared contributions for widely shared benefit. It should. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Deaton, for these insightful uh, comments. Before we move on to the discussion with uh, Professor Sen, I'm just going to say a few words um, about Professor Sen. Um, so Professor Amartya Sen received the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1998. His work contributed to the fields of welfare economics, political philosophy, and development. It's, it's hard to summarize his many contributions in a couple of minutes. So I will just briefly describe one of them that is related to the topic of our session. Um, Sen argued that the relevant question we should ask is not why equality, but rather equality of what? Should we aim at equalizing citizens' levels of happiness or their resources? or something else. Economists commonly adhere to some form of utilitarianism, which consists of evaluating well-being based purely on individual pleasures and desire fulfillments. But defining the common good as equal degrees of pleasure across people may lead to very unequal income distributions. For example, it would require giving a disproportionate share of resources to those whose only sources of pleasure are fancy champagne and caviar. On the other hand, the theory of social justice developed by John Rawls is based on how much primary goods, income, rights, etc., people have at their disposal. But by focusing on an equal distribution of goods, we ignore how much well-being people can achieve with these goods. And this may also create injustices. For example, a disabled person may not benefit as much as an able-bodied person from the same amount of resources. So Sen's own theory of equality avoids the pitfalls of both utilitarianism and Rawlsianism by introducing the notion of capabilities. It shifts attention from goods to what goods do to people, just like utilitarianism, but it uses a metric that focuses not on the pleasure that people get from these goods, but rather on their ability to achieve certain things with them, which, we, which he also calls freedom. Of course, this, this extremely short and oversimplified description is unable to do justice, no pun intended, to the subtlety of his views and to their far-reaching consequences. I encourage you to read his book, Inequality Reexamined, which fascinated me so much when I read it in my 20s that it led me to start studying economics. This is probably the least of your accomplishments, Professor Sen, <laughs> but it is one that matters a great deal to me. So thank you so much for this. Thank you.
Um, before I before we we get to the discussion, um, let me just remind the audience that you can ask your questions in the chat. Um, I will start with the first question, but then you know I will uh, uh, read questions from from the audience. Um, so let me let me start. My my first question is addressed to you, Professor Sen. Um, some of your most famous work concerns the relationship between famines and democracy. You argue that major famines never occur in democratic systems. And the argument is that the free press, by disseminating knowledge and allowing uncensored public criticism, is what holds governments accountable and forces them to, re to respond to the needs of their citizens. So I wonder to what extent the same argument applies to the current COVID pandemic. Many democracies from Europe to the US do not seem to have been particularly successful, at least at the beginning, um, in managing the pandemic, both in terms of death tolls and economic losses. So is there a sense in which perhaps the superiority of uh, democratic systems in managing such tragic events as famines or pandemics has weakened? And if so, would it have anything to do with the new media technologies that spread not only knowledge, but also fake news and conspiracy theories at an unprecedented, unprecedented scale? Um, I would be particularly interested in your views on India, which is democracy run currently by a populist government and which is sadly going through a devastating second wave of the virus uh, right now. Yeah, so I can really respond. Um, Thank you very much for that question. But, you know, I think uh, one of the big things that comes out from Angus's paper is how the world is divided in terms of opportunities as well as what they identify with, uh, what they sympathize with, and how it operates and how divisions like college uh, education makes a difference. And going further and quite deeper in the analysis, how things like interest rate policies also has an effect. Now, one thing just quickly to think about the famine thing. I mean, it, it is would be amazing if democracy could stop famine uh, in terms of just majority vote, because no famine ever affects more than 10% of the population. That's about the maximum and usually about 5-6%. So that's a minority. A majority vote democracy would do nothing to provide a bulwark against famine. What happens, however, is that public discussion, and basically what uh, Adam Smith would call mutual sympathy, operates in a way that the idea of people dying of hunger revolves a bulk of the, more than a majority of the population, and it becomes impossible to tolerate that. And that is the uh, way it tends to work, and when it doesn't work, then democracy will not have that feature. What's going to happen, to make a two quick point, one is that if you look at India now, uh, the famine issue was a big one for a long time, uh, connected with um, uh, 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 the British Empire and wanting to end it. But the division between the rich and the poor, the upper caste and the lower caste, remains very strong. And as it happened in recent years under the present government, which is very biased in the direction of the, of the wealthy and the, well, not supremely wealthy, but who are comfortably off compared with people who don't know where their next meal is coming from. So throughout, even when you, the Indian government introduced in four hours notice a lockdown, uh, there was no thought about what would happen to people who would lose their employment and who may be often very far away from their home. So there was a no lack, no sympathy which would carry the lesson of the pandemic to bigger society because the pandemic itself was so badly managed uh, and it's extremely badly managed 
uh, in India now. But you see, I think if you contrast it, um, if you think about it, it's something that Angus come, come, came close to, um, but given so many points he had to come away, he didn't accept so much that. In, if you look at the Second World War, uh, when the food supply in, in Britain fell, uh, fell dramatically. And so there was an idea about how to, what to do with it. And the general thought was, for the first time in British history, is that everyone must be somehow protected from hunger by rationing and control. So everyone getting food at uh, prices. The result was that what began as a threat ended up being an opportunity for everyone, including the very poor. And so the poor undernourished in Britain were having a better opportunity of eating well during the war than they had at any other time. And if you look at the life expectancy increase over the decade, in the decade preceding the war a decade, there were increase of life expectancy about one or one and a half years over the decade. But in the, in the war decade, it went up by six and a half to seven percent, because for the first time, people are being, were being fed uh, in a way that uh, changed a, a pre-existing inequality situation. And of course, that lesson was picked up again and again. I was very fortunate to work at the London School of Economics for a while, at LSE, that was one of the cultures, in fact, one of the first lessons I met from LSE. Uh, it was a man called Brian Abel Smith, who had come to Calcutta for a debate. I remember talking with him on that. And of course, that lesson was picked up, along with beverage and other commitments that were coming in to the Labour Party and others. Now, the, what happened is that this led to um, initiation of a welfare state. And the welfare state, where this, these things are shared, makes democracy much more potent. Now, one of the things that uh, uh, emerges from Angus's analysis is the inequalities that had been present before and that got uh, reinforced during the COVID academic, uh, COVID epi uh, episode. And the result was that the protection that you can get from democracy, and America is a democracy, did not go as far as it could have easily gone. And that is a problem, and I think that's uh, when uh, uh, Angus discussed uh, what had happened to blue collar workers uh, turning Republican uh, as opposed to more comfortable members of the working classes who may be in the Democratic Party. You find a kind of division whereby the main mechanism, and I was glad you raised the famine uh, and, 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 uh, and democracy preventing it, it works through that degree of um, sympathy for each other, which is very central to a democratic norm. Uh, it, 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 it's something uh, people don't read. I don't read that much these days. I was very pleased that uh, Anger had at least one quotation from, from Slint. Slint discusses that very much. This is where his idea of the impartial spectator come in, the fact that all of us have something of the impartial spectator in us. So I think if you broaden Ang Angus's analysis based on the secure foundation that he has provided, I think we can see, and uh, he was coming to that towards the end, what to do now is to somehow break down these barriers, and education will be a very big part of that, and then as he points out, even unsuspectingly, things like uh, interest rate policy has implications on that. 
So I'm delighted you raised that issue. I think this, the connection between family intervention and democracy isn't just, it's not a majority vote connection only. It is how a democracy operates in a society. It depends on things like inequality, college education, non-college education, on which Angus, among other things, concentrate. Um, these become very central to that. So as I read the paper, and for me, it is a kind of, I mean, I'm interested in the epistemology of it, obviously, but ultimately the ethics of it. Where do we go from here? What do we do now? I would say the lessons that emerges from Angus's paper is to see how democracy functions, can be made to function better. And that is not only good in itself, but it makes a major difference to survival, to inequality. And as he began by saying, inequality is not just income and wealth, but it's the way you can participate. Yeah, and it's uh, equality of participation, uh, or reduced inequality of participation. That's very central to that issue. So thank you very much, Nicola, for asking the question. Thank you, Professor Sen. Um, about uh, about this, um, and I'm going to ask this question to Professor Deaton in response to 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 his speech. Um, so a lot of your discussion of inequality was focused on the U.S. and a lot of the remedies you propose um, would bring the U.S. closer to a European-style welfare state. Um, and in fact, you know, in, in in Europe, at least in France, you know, healthcare is universal. We have no opioid epidemic. Uh, the share of income captured by the top 1% has not changed over the past 40 years, and so on and so forth. So we have our own list of problems, to be sure, but, but many of those you mentioned um, are not uh, issues here. And yet, you know, despite these successes, despite the generosity of the welfare state, and so on and so forth, we seem to have the same resentment uh, against the so-called elites, you know, think of the Yellow Vest movement in France recently or the rise of the radical right parties throughout the continent for years or even decades now. Um, so, it, and, and, I, and, and this idea of relational inequality that, uh, you know, the educated, the winners of the meritocratic race uh, don't treat others with the equal respect they deserve, that rings true to me from my conversations uh, 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 in France. But so I, it seems that having a welfare state, having lower levels of inequality is just not sufficient to prevent this kind of uh, resentment against elites and this kind of mutual uh, self-respect, uh, to, to, to foster this mutual self-respect that, that is lacking um, even in Europe. So, so, so what, could address, what could be used to address specifically this idea of, uh, of relational inequality? Yes, thank you. That's a really good question. Thank you, Marcia. I, w I want to come back to several of the points that Marcia made as well as your yeah, please, go, please go ahead. Yeah. Really, really good ones. Um, it's clear, obviously, that, you know, the situation in America is not, um, <laughs> is worse than anywhere else. <laughs> it's not unique, though, so that Britain has a deaths of despair problem, too, which has been rising. And my home country and Adam Smith's home country has levels of drug deaths that are comparable to the United States. It's the only other country in the world um, where we're seeing um, these sort of horrors. Um, but I, I think your question to Amartya was a great one and opens a really good line of inquiry here, um, which is I really wonder if the democracies as they are today would be as effective at preventing famine as you know, they used to be in the past, and that um, you know the sympathy that this community of sympathy that Adam Smith talked about. It's harder to imagine anywhere worse right now than the United States, where that community of sympathy does not exist, um, and this division that we have with no sympathy whatsoever on either side. Um, these polls suggest that if the other side died, people wouldn't care. So the idea that we would pull together in a pandemic or indeed in a famine um, is, I think, 
I, I hope it's not true, but I think it is true that um, the failure of democracy in America, and it isn't just America, as Nicholas says. So, and this, a lot of this was predicted by Michael Young, who wrote, you know, who defined the term of meritocracy. And he thought that the meritocrats would just pull away, they would steal the smartest children of the non meritocrats. And they would form a society by themselves that would despise the other half. And you get this breakdown of sympathy. And that seems to be happening everywhere. And in Britain, um, the parties, the, the Labour Party that used to represent workers, you know, has become an educated elite party, a cosmopolitan party. Um, whereas, you know, where my grandfather, the coal mining village in which my father grew up, um, voted conservative in the last election. And, you know, the, in the village of Thurcroft, there never was a single person who'd ever voted conservative or thought about voting conservative. <laughs> so the, the normal patterns of representation have broken down. And these bonds of sympathy, which, you know, I think I probably not only agree with Amartya, I've learned it from Amartya, um, are, are, seem to have frayed to a point that they pose enormous dangers to us all. So, you know, it's not just the American healthcare system, which I think is making it much worse. And that's one of the reasons why we have so many more deaths. But these problems of a meritocratic and educated and cosmopolitan elite that has been benefiting from globalization and technical change while the less educated are just abandoned and have no political representation everywhere. That seems to be happening widely across Europe. I think it also happened in Eastern Europe when they sent all their smartest kids off to work in the IMF or the EU or, or in Brussels and so on. And so you also deprive those working class areas of their natural representatives because, you know, when I was a kid in, in the villages in Scotland where we were, the, there were an incredible number of really, really smart, intelligent, well-read people um, who talked to each other and you could learn things from. And now all those people went to university and they're not there anymore. They live in London and they work in hedge funds or something. And so we, and I think that's happened in the U.S. too. You, you've sucked all the natural talent out of the left behind places. So there's no representation anymore. Um, the unions have gone. So a, a lot of the story from America applies elsewhere, even if the details um, really do not. Thank you, Professor Deaton. Um, let me ask a question from, from the audience uh, on the chat. Um, so, so it's it's addressed to Professor Sen, but I think it's uh, both of you would have uh, things to say about this. How can rich countries be mobilized to donate the fifty billion dollars to help uh, low and middle income countries with vaccine supply, as suggested by the IMF? And also, what is the strong moral ethical argument behind this call for help? So, I, uh, so let's ask Professor Sen first, because this is uh, to whom the question is asked. But I think, Professor Ditton, you have uh, strong views about the efficacy of foreign aid, so maybe you can also respond afterwards. Well, I don't know that uh, that's uh, easy to do and uh, can be done. And I could, you know, I come from India, <laughs> I am in India, but seeing how the rich in India had been separated out from the poor in India, and indeed the bulk of the population, and how little the rich in India had been doing for the poor, the question could easily be asked by somebody outside, saying, if the rich in India does so little, for the local poor, why is it the responsibility of Lithuania or, 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 or Italy or France to do anything about it? And I think that is a difficult issue. I think ultimately, of course, the answer is, I believe, this Smithian one, that the basic sympathy, no matter where people are suffering, uh, that can in potentially move people anywhere. And as such, the possibility remains that other countries may be motivated to help. But there are many barriers 
And one of the barriers is, which is not what we've got now, domestic inequality makes international inequality survive and, and thrive. But I'm very anxious to hear what Angus has to say on this. I'm actually not, well, let me preface something. There's an amazingly interesting contrast today between the U.S. and India. I mean, the U.S. has been very successful at giving free shots to a very large share of the population, in spite of having a totally dysfunctional healthcare system, which was almost totally not used in dispensing vaccines. You didn't get them in hospitals or in the doctor's offices. You got them in government-run health, government-run facilities, or, or or later in pharmacies. But the U.S. that believes in a market healthcare system provided these shots for free. Whereas in India, they're selling them, and in some cases, to the you know the, allowing the pharma companies to set whatever prices um, they think is um, appropriate. A little bit about foreign aid, though. You know. I'm not very surprised by what has happened. You know, it was the rich countries and India, let me put India aside for the moment, but it was the rich countries that made these vaccines who paid for them and who got them first. I mean, there are many different conceptions of whether that's just or not. But if you read the beginning of Amartya's book on the idea of justice, that's at least one conception of what many people think is just. We paid for it, we invented it. Um, we got it first, we give it to our people first. Um, beyond that, though, I actually don't think it's going to be so hard. It's going to take some time, and there's a lot of technical barriers to be overcome and so on. But I don't think there's an unwillingness among the elites in America to send a billion doses um, or billions of doses abroad to poor people around the world. And I think that will happen. I think it won't be as fast as we would like. Um, but my prediction is that that will happen and that there's no huge force against that, even by within the divides in, in American politics. I mean, I, as you said, Nicola, have been very critical of foreign aid in the past, but not of this sort of foreign aid. Right. Um, the foreign aid I've been critical of is foreign aid that interferes with the domestic political economy, especially in small countries like Africa that are enormously independent. This is not something that applies to India or to China, for example, but it's just that in those countries, spending a lot of money in those countries is very counterproductive. It creates dictatorships, it undermines um, tax collection, and it um, messes up the polity. Um, but that's not the case with things that come from outside like healthcare, not healthcare, like vaccines. And traditionally, um, or historically, um, vaccines from outside have been enormously effective in increasing life expectancy in poor countries around the world. And so I don't see any ethical or practical given time. Um, difficulties in doing this, or actually political difficulties, or practical difficulties. You've got to get these drugs made, and obviously we've lost the country that would have been the prime candidate for making huge amounts of vaccine um, to distribute around the world. So I'm fairly optimistic about that, but not in the next few weeks. Right. Um, thank, thank you so much to, to you both. Um, one more question. So I would like to go back to this argument, to the Skiv and Stasavage, um argument you made that, um, you know, this idea that the poor were paying the cost of the war with their blood. Um, and that's the kind of uh, using the rhetoric of, um, you know, the rich have to pay the wealthy who didn't pay as much of a cost uh, you know, would have to pay with their wealth, would have to pay the price of the of the war with their wealth. There have been similar arguments that have been made, um, according to which the World War II would have been responsible for the increase, you know, for the for the franchise, for the extension of the franchise. Um, and that goes back to what we were saying earlier about improving democracy. So uh, uh, here, these arguments um, are, you know, they 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 ring a bell. I mean, we hear, like you mentioned. Uh, the fact that the poor worker or the essential workers are those who disproportionately paid the cost uh, of the pandemic with their lives, um, and so that the that now the rich have to pay it 
uh, with their wealth, with the incredible amounts of wealth that have been accumulated during the pandemic. And so one idea that you that you dismissed, I guess, is the is the idea of the capital levy. And and, and that, that's I want I just want to make sure that everyone understands that this is not a radical idea. This idea of uh, taxing the wealth, um, one you know, one off tax on wealth. Um, that's been accumulated during COVID, and that could be used to pay for the for the for the pandemic. And if it's not enough, at least symbolically, it's an important way to show that you know we're all in this together. Um, more generally, you know, what would be ways in which you you think we could restore the fairness of the tax system, or this idea that everyone paid equally for this the the, the burden of this pandemic? I think that's probably for me, but um, I'd be interested in what Amartya thinks about this too. I, you know, Amartya's examples of, of Britain in 1945, or even when he was first at the LSC in the 60s, you know, that's not the world we live in anymore. And, you know, I, I think, Nicola, what you said is makes perfect sense. You know, let the capitalists pay in treasure and let the workers pay in blood. This is like a war, let's do this. Um, and several people I've talked to, you know, not just in France, but also in Italy, where Tito Bori has been pushing this, but getting no reaction, no positive reaction at all um, in government circles. So I think it's a great idea. I don't think it's radical, but I think it seems radical right now because the forces of wealth are so strong that um, I just can't see it happening in the U.S., there was a discussion in Britain, there was a, a commission with a number of um, quite distinguished um, people um, involved in that and worked out a very detailed proposal. Um, I don't see that that's going to be adopted either. Part of the problem is that, that has, there are technical problems. I mean, that had a very low threshold, um, which meant most of it fell on ordinary people through their houses and their pensions. And it didn't get at these billionaires. Of course, there aren't so many billionaires in Britain. So you know, we really want um, you know we want Bill Gates and we want Bezos to pay for the pandemic. You could, you could make it progressive, right? Or you could, for example, tax the capital gains that have been um, that have been you know. I think that would be a really good idea. I think there's negligible political chance of that happening. Right. But I'm, I'm very depressed about that because it's happened before. It's not a radical idea. And the fact that it seems like a radical idea now is a terrible thing. And, and what I meant by, by this is not a radical idea is that this is an idea that's been around so for a century. I mean, Keynes, um, Hicks, Pigou, all those great British economists in the 1920s were arguing that this should be the right instrument to pay for the cost of World War One. And recently it's been formalized by the Chicago economists Nancy Stokey and, and, and Robert Lucas. Um, I just want to read a quote from... Um, John Cochrane, who is a very conservative economist and who wrote in February 2020, so a month before uh, this all happened in, in the US, um, that such a capital levy is in theory um, the optimal tax instrument. And he writes, capital levies are something that governments can do only in extremely rare, visible, once per century crisis with some strong pre-commitment never to do it again. So, so that seems like exactly the conditions we are in now. And in fact, he was using this argument to argue against a permanent wealth tax. He says, well, let's do a one-off tax, but this can only happen in the kind of events that we are living now. And that was before uh, the pandemic. So that, that's not related to that. So, so maybe, Professor Sen, do you want to comment no, on this? I entirely agree with that, yeah. Absolutely sure. Uh, yeah, and I entirely agree also that it's not a new idea. And there were, for those who were concerned with these issues, like um, uh, you know, the John Leonard Keynes and the consequences of disease and so on, dealing in, in that case uh, with the Versailles Agreement, they, were, they went through these arguments fairly thoroughly at that time. And somehow, as Angus said, even though it seems to be sitting in front and not a new idea, its chances of being adopted is extremely little. So I hope it. I will hope it'll happen. But you know, there's a counter argument to the Cochrane argument too, which is extraordinary circumstances in which it can only be done once. That's what 
income taxes were introduced that way in many countries around the world, in Britain to pay for the Napoleonic War, while well, we still have the income tax. So the credibility of saying we'll only do this once, once you set up the apparatus to evaluate things and all the rest of it, and to avoid <laughs> people shifting assets. Yeah, and people can shift assets around very, very quickly. You, yeah, you so might... I mean, it, it would need to be somewhat coordinated, I guess, at least within the EU, for example. Uh, but um, um, but yeah, I agree that the credible commitment to never do it again is uh, is perhaps a long shot. No, it's just if you have a forty million dollar offset, for right. instance, you suddenly discover that all the people who are worth forty million dollars, there's a lot more people worth just under forty million dollars, and then it's right. very happy, hard to calculate. Right, yeah. right, right. Um, let's talk briefly about uh, um, intergenerational inequalities. So, so the older generations have been clearly the most directly affected by COVID, but there is another group about which I'm very worried. It's children. Um, so many countries have attempted to reduce infection, infection rates by closing schools, sometimes for a long time, more than six months in the UK, um, more than one year in some parts of India. Um, like you mentioned, Professor Deaton, there is a huge body of economic research that evaluates the returns to schooling for uh, children, and they are enormous. So the evidence from, for example, changing compulsory schooling laws suggests that an additional year of education would raise future earnings by between 10 and 15 percent. So as schools close, we should expect a dramatic rise in the pre-existing inequalities between families who can afford to keep providing privately a high-quality education to their children and those with less time, money, or lower educational resources who can't. Um, and so these, these effects, these devastating effects on educational inequalities, how will they manifest in the future for this generation? And how should we prepare to tackle their consequences? I think we're just sitting here nodding because uh, <laughs> we agree, but I don't think we have much idea of how to what um, to do about it. But it certainly it does suggest that the priorities that were priorities before, like decent education for kids in inner cities in the U.S., where, for instance, there are schools that have never sent anyone to college, for instance, that becomes even more of a priority because those are the people who have been hurt. And, um, you know, I have three grandchildren. <laughs> they have prospered mightily during the pandemic, you know, and they've had a lot of fun. They may have suffered a little bit from not getting to hang out with their friends in the way that they did, but there's not been much of that either. And the private schools have been incredibly good at dealing with that. They were testing kids, you know, every couple of days from the very beginning. Um, they changed their operations a little bit, but hardly at all. And it's been a disaster for lots of other people. And I think... You know, that's something we're not focusing on right now um, because there are more urgent things to do, like getting people vaccinated. Um, incidentally, I saw the other day that the vaccine hesitancy is almost entirely explained not by racial differences or by Republican um, Democrat differences, but by education once again. Um, there are very few people with a four-year college degree who are unlikely to finish up being vaccinated. So we have another echo of deaths down there. But this will become a huge problem as we go ahead. And I don't have any immediate plans for solving it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I think one of the striking facts is that there was a time when, let's begin with school education, then we can think about college. The, Europe was carried over, as was Japan, with a determination to get every school child educated. In case of Japan, this happened following the major restoration, and this was, you know, um, I think Tabe Yushi and so on. They were, uh, uh, the major restoration was, I think, uh, uh, 1868, and by about 72. Uh, the, the Japanese have decided that within within four decades they were to get everybody schooled, and that happened. And uh, it, it, however, it didn't happen. And in to some extent, it happened in China, for, for coming from a different angle. 
namely Maoist commitment. It was in fact something they were discussing even at the, after the long march uh, where Mao's theories were being spelled out. Um, it didn't happen at that time uh, in India, and uh, which is a very big part of the world, and, and it didn't happen in many other countries, it didn't happen in the Middle East and so on. And then gradually there was a kind of pressure in, the, in that direction. Um, on the European side, this had happened, but the various countries, including Britain, the hesitation about college was a big thing. And if you think about the time when I first arrived in England in the in the in the sixties and so on, this is the time when um, uh, Lionel Robbins was with the Conservative Economist under the leadership. There was the Robbins Commission about is concerned with uh, Angus's concern, namely college education for all, and this became a big thing. And somehow that has declined reflectively in their own uh, particular ways. The college education uh, form where in, in in America there was always greater sympathy for college education than, say, in Britain. But that is uh, the, the nature of that commitment that's been shifting. In India, it was a move in the opposite direction. Angus made in passing in half a sentence that now even vaccines are sold in India. It's just an amazing thing. You can't think of something which... Uh, it's very important for people's well-being, and it's also very important for other people's well-being. I mean, this is something that uh, Figu came up earlier. Well, Figu, in the 1920s, should have seen no problem with, but it's declined. And I think the, uh, the uh, we'll have to do a different paper. We said doing it, dealing with India, the full field. Uh, and the focus on America and the West, which is mainly the focus here of Angus's very nice, extraordinarily nice paper. But in India, why is this been happening? It is a, it's a very big issue. And why is it that the COVID has not acted as a as a bulwark against it, as a as going against it? And of course. Democracy, if I may come back, is something to do with it now. I mean, there are a huge number of people who want it, and they're put in jail. The British used to have, while ruling India, um, something called, um, uh, um, uh, I've forgotten the technical term, that is basically you can put people to jail, not because they have done anything wrong, but they might do. All my uncles were in jail because, not because they had done anything, but left free they could. And they, and and after after independence, that was abolished in India. Then it came back, came back in a massive way. And now, a large number of people uh, are, are in are in jail for having advocated the right of everyone to have school. They right of everyone to be able to have entitlement to food, not to mention vaccine. And so I think um, I, I did want to mention that since you raised in, in the context of my dialogue with you, the famine and democracy, democracy is still very important and, and this Indian Supreme Court activism in preventing uh, these aberrations would be very important. Habeas corpus, which was dropped in India a right, few years ago, Supreme Court hasn't had time to look at it. But habeas corpus is very important for, for the kind of life that, uh, that we can have. Is an extension of 
MSS paper to us countries like India. We have to think about it uh, very powerfully. And the fact that democracy with all its fault has some fault in America is to some extent brought up by the fact that the country without a, uh, a point that Angus made, uh, that a country without national health service still managed to give people, every, try to give everyone a uh, vaccine and give them a high proportion already there. And where do you go? You go absolutely everywhere. Uh, your football stadium, uh, and everything was recruited for this purpose because there was pressure, democratic pressure in that direction. So democratic pressure remains very important. And I think this Republican uh, um, democratic division and the Republicans getting, as Angus discussed it, a particular type of people who were not in the past Republican, like the blue collar workers, but who feel rejected and chained by the society. Uh, that division is, 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 has a, a very strong consequence, and we have to uh, redefine the politics, political need of each country at this time. It's a very important moment. So when I was reading Angus's paper, I was telling myself that we have to redefine the political commitment. When I was young, the main commitments were driven by other factors, like Vietnam War and you know, colonialism, uh, China, the Opium War, and so on, India, the large and finishing. And of course now we are in a different type of puddle from which we have to pull ourselves out. And I think what we need are people, exactly papers like that of Angus, but covering more and more parts of the world, to see that we can move towards a use of institutions like democracy, which has existed, but have a different kind of urgency today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sen. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time. I'm not going to ask you my last question, which was um, about the responsibility of economists in the rise of inequality. That will be for um, another debate, but I would have been looking forward to hearing your, your thoughts on this, both of you. Thank you so much for um, uh, participating in this uh, discussion. This was, I have to say, extremely insightful to, to hear you both. To hear both. Um, Thank you, everyone in the audience as well. And sorry, I didn't get to ask more of your questions. Um, I hope you enjoyed the, the discussion. And thank thank you. you very much, Nicola. Thank you, Marcia. This was fun. Thank you. Je remercie les écoles parisiens Challenge et Toulouse School of Economics pour cette invitation. C'est un plaisir d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui depuis Toulouse. Savez-vous que lorsque vous êtes à la Toulouse School of Economics, dans ce bâtiment avant-gardiste que la région a choisi de financer, vous êtes aussi à quelques mètres de la première société par action de l'histoire la Société des Moulins du Bazacle, créée en 1372. Le site dans lequel s'inscrit TSE est dans la mémoire de Toulouse le symbole du miracle économique dont bénéficia la ville jusqu'à la fin du 19e siècle, pendant près de 10 siècles. Ensuite, il y eut l'aéronautique, ses pionniers, puis aujourd'hui un lieu dédié à l'innovation et à la diffusion de la recherche. Cet esprit pionnier et de partenariat, nous le retrouvons à TSE. Porté par Jean Tirole, prix Nobel d'économie en 2014, TSE est pour la région une fierté et une brique majeure du modèle d'excellence et d'inclusion que nous défendons en Occitanie pour la future Université de Toulouse. Mais c'est bien parce qu'elle rayonne très au-delà d'Occitanie qu'elle est une fierté. TSE, avec plus de 200 chercheurs et doctorants, compte parmi les 10 meilleurs centres de recherche en économie dans le monde. Pour protéger le bien commun, il faut d'abord et surtout de la détermination et la volonté politique de faire du commun. 
Dans une société fragmentée, qui est parfois très violente pour les gens, on voit le risque des replis individualistes. Et avec cela, le risque que la politique se résume à du marketing électoral, choisissant ses cibles catégorielles et oubliant les femmes et les hommes dans leur diversité. Ici, avec la présidente de région Carole Delga, on a la volonté de servir, servir le plus grand nombre, de concilier l'attention pour chacun et l'ambition pour tous. Nous avons la volonté d'être utiles et donc de répondre aux besoins de nos habitants et de construire les conditions pour un avenir commun. Ils font combiner la hauteur, voire loin, et la proximité. Alors ça ne vous étonnera pas que je considère que l'échelon régional, l'échelon local est le plus efficace pour combiner vision stratégique et proximité. Plus on est proche des gens, plus on est en mesure de répondre à leurs besoins, parce qu'on connaît ces besoins, parce qu'on les entend, on les écoute, qu'on vit avec celles et ceux qu'on doit servir, et qu'on construit aussi les solutions avec eux. Confronté à l'urgence sanitaire, l'urgence économique et sociale, beaucoup de choses que l'on croyait impossibles dans une économie mondialisée ont été réalisées localement. Des usines qui changent totalement leur production pour fournir les hôpitaux locaux. Des collectivités qui parviennent mieux que l'État à organiser des distributions de masques pour nos soignants, nos enseignants, nos élèves, à mettre en place des aides économiques au plus près du terrain, de nos commerçants, de nos artisans. Je suis une élue de terrain et je mesure pleinement la nécessité d'avoir une action publique plus souple et plus agile. C'est la République des territoires que Coral Delga défend. Un modèle des solutions à l'échelle humaine et locale, loin de la complexité administrative. Je crois dans l'intelligence collective et dans l'initiative locale, avec des méthodes et des outils. Les partenariats entre acteurs privés et publics, entre collectivités, entre recherche et industrie, des budgets participatifs, des politiques contractuelles type boursantes, des agents et des maisons de la région sur tous les territoires. Protéger le bien commun, c'est refuser le déterminisme social ou l'assignation à résidence en développant les réseaux qui relient les femmes et les hommes, les réseaux de mobilité avec le train, les TER, mais aussi en exigeant la LGV dans nos territoires, les réseaux de télécommunication avec le très haut débit partout, pour tous, les réseaux économiques, ces pôles de compétitivité, ces clusters. Enfin, protéger le bien commun, c'est savoir protéger et préserver son territoire, sa nature, en promouvant un nouveau modèle de développement plus durable. Première région à adopter un Green New Deal, nous affirmons la possibilité de concilier économie et écologie, en associant les citoyens à la construction de leur avenir. C'est bâtir avec eux un pacte. Quand on fait le pari de la réindustrialisation en devenant une région actionnaire de nos entreprises régionales, quand on fait le pari du patriotisme économique régional en créant le premier outil de financement des entreprises par les citoyens, on génère une communauté de destin. C'est ce que l'on fait à la région et on le fait depuis le début, depuis que Carole Delga a décidé de permettre aux habitants de notre région de choisir son nom en commun, Occitanie.